Well, good morning and welcome to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV Big Fox. I think we're all up and running. I'm your host, Frank Acom. We're broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio here on Market Street in Corning. And we have an exciting show in store for you on this Friday morning. Lisa Illig Homan, she's running for Fourth Ward. Corning City Council. She's going to be our guest in just a little bit. I'm going to put up, we have jam-packed week next week as well. First, let's get to a comment that I received after the program yesterday. I know I've said this before, Frank, but I totally agree with another viewer's comments on Joe Sempolinski. I love it when he is a guest. His common sense rules, and it's just refreshing. Makes my day. I agree it makes my day when Joe Sempolinski former congressman and current chairman of the Steuben County Republican Committee is our guest. And we have him on. We try to have him on once a month. Uh, so we appreciate him taking the time out. And I also appreciate, and I'm sure he does too, I will tell him all the nice compliments that he receives. Okay, let's take a look at next week's lineup. Obviously, we near election day, very near to election day on November 7th. I will be reminding you frequently to remember to vote. Uh, but next, this was really the, the very busy week. Next week, it starts busy and it's kind of fun. Let's look at this. Here's our lineup. On Monday, Allison Hunt will be joining us, candidate for Steuben County Legislature. On Tuesday, Vicki Olin, she's with the Steuben County Board of Elections. She's just going to remind us some of the who, what, when, where, and why that we need to know before we head to the voting booth. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be talking election results all morning long. So that's just time for you and me to spend together. Thursday, yes, you read that right. Don McClain, American Pie, one of the all-time great songs. That was his song. Don McClain is going to join us on Thursday. And then Friday, we'll talk with Kevin from Twin Tears Comic Con, which is coming up that weekend. So a lot of guests next week. And as always... I know I've said it before, but you can contact me if you have any questions for our guests. Do you want a question for Don McLean, who wrote American Pie? Do you have a question for Allison Hunt or even our guest this morning? It's not too late. Lisa Illig Homan. You can get that to me at any time at either of those venues. Text or call. Email. Or just watch the program. I like, I like all of those options. All right. One quick, well, you know what? We're going to get to this breaking story uh, coming from New York State of Politics uh, when we come back from break. We're also going to be talking about the House passing the $14.3 billion uh, Israel funding bill. Now, that is a solo bill. We talked about this extensively with Joe Sempolinski yesterday. Um, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson uh, decided to decouple Israeli funding from Ukrainian funding. Uh, so that has passed the House. As a matter of fact, the vote was 226 to 196. We'll uh, get our Congressman Nick Langworthy's um, statement on it. That'll be coming up. And we'll also talk about the implications because uh, there's been threats of veto by the president. Um, we know it could have a tough battle in the Senate because for whatever reason, um, there is that push that they have to be together. The two fundings have to be together. And like the, the former congressman said yesterday, why? They're two separate issues. So we'll talk about that when we come back. Stay with us. We're just getting started on this Friday edition of Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, stay with us. Look at that beautiful view of Marcus Street. That's where we're broadcasting live from, the Hesselson Studio. I'm your host, Frank Acom. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV Big Fox. Coming from New York State of Politics.com, New York Comptroller Tom DiNapoli, according to him, a longtime clerk treasurer in Steuben County, has been arrested for stealing more than $1.1 million dollars in village funds over the course of at least 19 years. Ursula Stone, 55 years old, who worked for the village of Addison. I know we have many viewers from the Addison area. She worked 
for the village of Addison from 1997 to last March. She was charged with grand larceny, money laundering, corrupting the government, public corruption, attempted grand larceny, attempted public corruption, and 185 counts of falsifying business records. 185 counts of falsifying business records. All of those felonies. According to DiNapoli, an audit of the village in 2022 found that Stone had been running the financial operations of the village with no oversight or credibility, or accountability, I should even say. She prepared payroll, maintained manual leave records, and processed health insurance buyouts and unused leave payments with no review or approval from the mayor or the board. Um, the comptroller's office found that checks from the Addison Central School District payable to the village were not deposited into the village's accounts. A joint investigation found that Stone allegedly stole not only the school district's checks, but also dozens of other checks payable to the village, which she converted to certified bank checks and then cashed. That's according to this investigation. Um, additionally, investigators found Stone allegedly gave herself unauthorized pay raises took time off without deducting it from her leave credits and wrote herself checks for unauthorized health insurance buyouts from village funds. Now she resigned back in March during this investigation, submitting her resignation letter. Listen to this, allegedly. She wrote herself a final check of $26,613, an odd, oddly specific amount of money, which was then not authorized by the village board, though the board stopped payment on the check before she was able to cash it. In total, investigators have said that she allegedly stole $1,171,362. She was arraigned in Steuben County Court and bail was set at $20,000. She's due back in court on January 24th. That's coming from New York. Politi or, uh, excuse me, nystateofpolitics.com if you want to uh, see the quotes on that. All right, we've got to take another short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the aid for Israel, <clears throat> pardon me, passing the House. That's when we come back, and we also have Lisa illig -Homan coming in as our guest. I see her coming up right now, so stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. <laughs> Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Hakem, and joining us back in the studio, wow, with days left to go yeah. before the big day, Lisa illig -Homan. Thanks so much for being on the program. Morning, Frank. Thank you for having me. And so, when you got a few days left. Yep. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. good. I feel like I've done everything I could. I've spent, I can't even count how many hours out, you know, meeting mm -hmm. my neighbors, of reconnecting course. with my neighbors, knocking every door. Now I'm on round two of re-knocking those doors. Um, really? So I'm feeling good. I hope, uh, you know, we've been looking at the numbers for early voting. Not mm -hmm. a ton of people getting out. I think yeah. a lot of people like to wait for election day. Um, so we'll be we'll be watching that, of course. Well, we talked to Joe Semplinski yesterday, and, and I know they're encouraging people to go out uh, and early vote, but I'm I'm kind of that myself, that nerd that likes to yes. go out the day. You get the sticker and it's all fun. I, don't I get it, yeah, yeah, but you never know, you know? What if you get super sick or, right. you know, work gets crazy. That happens to me all the time where I plan to do stuff and then work gets crazy. So mm -hmm. if you can take advantage of it, there's no reason not to. No, and I know I was talking to Joe about this, and it's, you know, when it's national, when it's presidential, you remember because you're right. inundated with that message. Uh -huh. But Tuesday, Day, we've got to remind people to vote because it'd be very easy to miss that if you forgot. Absolutely. And a lot of people I've talked to, but you know, when's the election? Oh, okay. Where do we vote? Is it the senior center this year? Is it the union? Yeah. So it's the library, early voting the library, election day the library, um, for my ward at for least. Your ward, yes. For your ward. Uh, so what are these last few days going to look like for you? Well, I am, like I said, on round two of knocking. So I'm kind of strategically, there were unfortunately a lot of blocks that I hit and, you know, I have color coded my highlights. So orange meant I knocked your door, but I only left a hanger. I wasn't able to talk to you. So there were kind of big chunks of orange. So I'm trying to go back and, 
you know, although I left that door hanger, I want the neighbors to know I actually want to speak to them. I want to meet them, shake their hand. So sure. trying to reconnect with those people that I that I missed. Have you had fun knocking on doors and talking? With I everybody? have. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to be honest, the last week where it's dark and cold at yeah. 630 at night, it's been like a, a grind. But yeah. in general, absolutely. It's but been so nice. You're used to that for petitions. That's yeah. how it was oh in my petitions. Gosh, it yeah. seems like it's always cold when you're knocking on doors. Yeah, and I have to, you know, I have to knock from like 5.45 to 7 every night because my kids get home from school, I feed them dinner, <laughs> sure. run out the door, knock, and get home for bedtime. So <laughs> well, it's, it's only so many hours in a day. That's the fun of politics. Yes. <laughs> so when you're talking to your neighbors, what, do you, what have you found to be the biggest issues in the fourth ward? Uh, and, you know, a lot of common, you know, streets, sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks are a big passion of mine. I oh. bring my kids out on their scooters and they're sure. hitting the bumps constantly <laughs> and stuff like that. So just in general, those types of things. Um, and they just want to know that they have someone they can call if something does happen mm -hmm. that will advocate for them. Because, you know, anyone can go to city council meetings and the last agenda item is non-agenda topics. Anyone can go up and speak, but not everyone's comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little intimidating to go up there. And also some people work on the first Monday of every month. So I've just been trying to reinforce, you know, I'm happy to be to listen to you, to advocate for you, to be your voice. So what will some of your goals be? Um, I'd like to get involved, like I said, on like the budget. Um, the comprehensive mm -hmm. plan has been a big discussion. I, in my day job, you know, I work on project budgets, project milestones, keeping things on track. And I think I can bring that experience to, to that budget and comprehensive process. So I know some of these questions are repeats, but if people haven't, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. just the nature of it. But if people haven't uh, heard from you in the past, if they're new to the program, why did you decide to run? Sure. Um, so I was born and raised here. Mm -hmm. My dad, Mark Illig, was actually on city council, the same seat I'm running for, for eight years. Uh, and then I moved away for college a bunch of years, and my husband was in the Army. So we've lived in Arizona, Texas, near Canada, et cetera, and we just always wanted to get back to Corning. Now that we're back, um, I have kind of this moral conundrum, like I've said before, of I work in IT, I sit at my computer, I do nothing I feel like that tangibly gives back. Sure. I'm not a nurse, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a police officer. Um, so I felt like this was a good way to give back to the community that I love. I just want to keep shaping Corning to be somewhere that everyone wants to move back to and raise their families and stuff. And I know this is basic 101, but it is confusing when it's local. Who can vote for you? So anyone that lives, uh, or any registered voter that lives in the fourth ward in Corning. So the fourth ward starts um, up State Street, so like Carter School, and then it goes west. So okay. you have... McKinney Park, um, you know, West 3rd, 2nd, 1st, Sunset Drive, okay. Mountain Brow Apartments, etc. It's a pretty big walk then. It is, and it's not flat, I'll no. tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Got your steps in yeah. this season. Uh, so looking back at it, because we've talked for a while now, what surprised you the most about this process? How many people um, are not involved? So yeah. how many people don't know about, you know, where to vote, how to vote, what yeah. ward they live in, what a ward is, what city yeah. council does. So it's been really nice to get out and educate and I've taken it um, upon myself, obviously, to start going to all the city council meetings and learning. So I, I did that as a kid with my dad. I would always go watch. Um, but just reconnecting with the council and learning what they're doing and what they're focusing on right now so that I can communicate that back to the voters. Now, I do think that's one of the big fears about voting because, uh, like you said, some people, and it's not a knock on them, but they're not Absolutely, as informed. Yeah. People's lives are busy. Yeah. So, when, uh, so that's why we try to reiterate over yeah. and over again to vote on Tuesday and do the yes. research. And that's why I love having the candidates, and that's why I appreciate you being on the yeah. program. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not everyone's sitting down and reading the paper every right, morning anymore, exactly. right? So. And a lot of times the information isn't in there, so it's yeah. tough to do the research, and not everybody has time to go to, to the meeting, like yep. you said. So we're, we're winding down. It's on Tuesday. Yep. How can people help your campaign in these last few days? So um, social media is huge. Mm -hmm. I have a Facebook page if you want to like, share, comment, any, any of those normal things. Sure. It's a little late, but if you want a yard sign, call me. <laughs> Every little bit helps. Um, but mostly just spreading the word and helping your neighbors vote. So if people can't get out to vote, if they don't know where to vote, they need a ride, anything like that, mm -hmm. the biggest thing is going to be voter turnout, I feel. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just getting out and doing your part. And... Just a reminder, early voting is still open throughout the weekend. So if you're not available on Tuesday and want to get out and early vote, that is open to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you don't get a chance this weekend, please get out and vote on Tuesday. All right, final question. Then you don't have to be on Frankly Speaking any longer. <laughs> what would you say to the voters before they head to the booth? So first thing, like I said, please get out and vote and help your neighbors vote. Um, and second, just I want to be dedicated to this job. I want to be your voice. I want to, you know, if you have a concern, come over and have a cup of coffee for you with you and be your advocate. So I would just vote for the voter, the candidate that you think is going to spend the time 
to listen to you, to hear from you, and to advocate for you on the city council. Great. Well, thank you in this whole season for giving us so much time. Yeah, thank you for having me, Frank. I Best appreciate it. Best of luck. It. Best thank of luck you. on Tuesday. All right, we'll be right back with Frankly Speaking. Stay with us. Thank you again for joining us here on Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I am your host, Frank Akam, and we are broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. We're having a lot of fun. I, I know uh, when we have candidates on, no matter who it is, they're thinking about those last few days. Uh, it's probably stressful. Uh, me, on the other hand, I'm, I'm loving it, every second of it, <laughs> which is probably not fair that I can have this much fun while everybody, all these candidates working so hard, are, are nervous. Lisa Alec Homan didn't sound nervous, so she's doing a great job. Candidate for Corning City Council, Fourth Ward. She does a great job on this program, and uh, I'm so glad that all of the candidates, and I, I, I have one more guest on Monday, Allison Hunt, but I want to thank all the candidates for just a moment for being on the program uh, and so many people uh, for reaching out and uh, just being a part of the program. I know we're relatively new, uh, and so I, I can't thank you enough for trusting me to do the best interview I can for all parties. We've had a, a great mix, Democrats and Republicans. It's been, well, again, like I was saying with Lisa, it's about getting the word out because where do you go? You know, you go into the booth and I, I, no one wants to go in and just vote because you may recognize a name or you went to school with his kid or something like that. You, you really want to be informed because, again, it's these local races that affect your day-to-day -day life more than the national. I mean, of course, the national is fun to watch, and, and of course, it's very important to participate, uh, but the local uh, city councils, town boards, those are the people that directly affect your day-to-day -day life on a regular basis. So that's why we try to spread the, the word, as we have been saying from the beginning, this program's about community, and we want you to go into that booth as informed as possible. So thank you to everybody who, have been, who has been on the program these last couple months. All right, so we, we've been teasing this all morning to give you more information. The House did pass a $14.3 billion uh, solo aid for Israel. Um, it passed 226 to 196. Um, that's 214 Republicans voting for it and 12 Democrats voting in support as well. So of course, it's bipartisan. House Speaker Mike Johnson said, tonight a bipartisan group of members voted to send immediate aid to Israel, our greatest ally in the Middle East. Our supplemental package, which is fully offset, provides Israel with advanced weapons systems, supports the Iron Dome missile defense system, and replenishes American domestic defense stockpiles. This is necessary and critical assistance as Israel fights for its right to exist. With, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, Speaker Johnson said this, with anti-Semitism on the rise, both domestically and abroad, it's imperative that the U.S. sends a message to the world that threats made against Israel and the Jewish people will be met with strong opposition. The Senate and White House cannot let this moment pass, and I urge them to act swiftly and pass this bill as the House did today. Uh, this is going to lead to a quote-unquote fight in the Senate, and we'll see where it goes if it does pass the Senate, uh, because the president has threatened to veto it. Now, our Congressman, Nick Langworthy, released a statement on this yesterday evening. Let me put that up on the screen for you, and we'll read along. I will always stand with Israel, and they need our support now more than ever to defend their freedoms following the brutal terrorist attack of October 7th. The world is watching as we send a message to our allies and our adversaries that we will not allow this senseless terrorism to go unchecked. I'm proud to support this aid package to provide Israel with the resources they need to defend themselves, eradicate Hamas, and fight global terrorism. I've got to say I'm glad that the congressman mentioned that very important point, eradicate Hamas, because yesterday... We had mentioned uh, a very good piece, and thank you again to Congressman Nick Langworthy for that statement. Um, we had talked about a concern that the New York Post had, and I mentioned it to the former Congressman, Joe Sempolinski, that is Biden going to get weak on his stance on Israel? Because he has been strong in his stance, but you started to see a little crack. Crack here, crack there. Uh, the other day he said there should be a pause. We're gonna get to that in just a second. 
But what had been suggested in that New York, uh, New York Post piece is that with his poll numbers down so low across the nation, and with these threats by some Democrats that his support, his strong support for Israel could cost him votes, will he turn all in the name of politics? Will he weaken all in the name of politics? And I think that is a fair question. Um, many have questioned his decision making on foreign policy throughout his whole career. If you remember, if you recall, he was, I believe, the only person in Obama's inner circle to suggest not killing Osama bin Laden when they had the opportunity. So obviously we raise some concerns when we when we think about his foreign policy, but I will say up until what two days ago, he had been very strong with his support for Israel. But then, tell me if this isn't related, we go, Democrats fear that Biden's Israel Hamas war stance could cost him re-election in Michigan. I will say being strong in your support for Israel, if that costs you votes in your party, you've got to wonder maybe some of the, um, I don't know, some of, in the background, I don't know how many votes it'll cost, but you've got to wonder about the positions of some of the people in your party. I mean, strong support for our ally Israel shouldn't I shouldn't cost you this amount of votes unless your party has put a strong emphasis on not wanting to support Israel, which would be what this would signal to me, if that makes sense to you. Democrats in Michigan, and that's not by statement, I am saying, just looking at the facts here, Democrats in Michigan have warned the White House that President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas conflict could cost him enough support within the Arab American community to sway the outcome of the 2024 election in a state he almost certainly can't afford to lose in his bid for re-election. The situation has prompted the White House to discuss ways to alleviate tensions with some of the state's prominent Democrats. So prominent Democrats not happy with Joe Biden's pro-Israel stance, including in those Democrats, several who have been vocal critics of the president about the war. So, and I say maybe these will tie together, uh, as the New York Post says, will that make him weaken his stance? Well, Biden and his team send blunt warning to Israel. Civilian suffering in Gaza will weaken public support for the war against Hamas. We talked about this again extensively yesterday, but this idea that um, Israel continues to be lectured uh, by certain groups to say you um, you can't essentially defend yourself and retaliate in this case um, after be, after this brutal terrorist attack, and you can't uh, end Hamas as we know it. And that's why I said earlier that I'm glad that uh, Congressman. Uh, Langworthy mentioned that specifically in his speech, eradicate Hamas. Because as we know, and there and there's a piece here, not a piece, but a quote, which is kind of shocking in a way. And it's Democrat Senator Chris Murphy, and he was on MSNBC. Now listen to this, and it ties in. I know it's this is a little bit of a tangent, but bear with me uh, about this idea that the White House is lecturing Israel, that you're going to lose public support for the war against uh, Hamas. So Senator Murphy said, so there's no doubt Israel has the right to defend itself, of course. And there's no doubt that Hamas is responsible for these civilian casualties. And that's where the criticism is coming from, from some saying, well, there's um, these civilian casualties. But like Murphy, and he does lose me at some point, trust me, I, that's why I'm building up to this. But he says Hamas is responsible for these civil civilian casualties because they hide them themselves, meaning Hamas, their weapons, their infrastructure inside civilian buildings, mosques, schools, and hospitals. But this is where I always have a problem because it never, it never ends there. They're responsible for it. Then he continues because he, he can't let it end there. It's always that but or and. Uh, but Israel does have a responsibility to weigh the cost to civilians against the ability to target Hamas leaders. 
So Hamas is responsible for civilian deaths, but quote, the moral cost of Israel's tactics are too high. Now, I would love to hear your opinion on it because I'm going to tie it back in. We, we have to take a break here. But And I, I didn't mean to necessarily quote Senator Murphy that early on, but you see what Hamas is doing, but then the White House telling Israel to pause, to stop, and the New York Post editorial board echoes what I said yesterday and, and my... I wish I didn't have this film, but my feeling on it as well, and that is Biden's call for an Israel pause means he's jumping ship on our ally. Yes, this is the weakening that we spoke of yesterday, and I was concerned about when we saw the pause. It was kind of breaking at that point, if I'm not mistaken, and I and I told uh, Joe Sempolinsky that this is, or I didn't tell him, I said we commented back and forth on it, that that is a major concern because if you start to see those cracks in our support for Israel, it's going to be bad. They do need to, as the Congressman Nick Langworthy said, eradicate Hamas. President Biden late Wednesday suddenly started talking about a pause in Israel's operation to root Hamas out of Gaza. De facto, starting to jump ship even faster than we feared. We're going to continue this discussion. Please weigh in at any time you see the number on the bottom of your screen. But we do have to, to take a short break, and then we'll continue with this opinion and uh, more comment on Israel. When we come back, this is Frankly Speaking. Stay with us. are watching frankly speaking here on big fox broadcasting live from the hesselson studio here on market street we received a comment during break if someone can point out when the democrats have tried to differentiate the difference between what's right and wrong instead of when they want just votes and power i am all ears send your comments in we try to read as many of them as we can um time willing so uh, if you see that number on the bottom of your screen, text, or you can call if you're not a text person and leave a voicemail. So back to this idea that because Biden is calling for a pause, that he is weakening and the New York Post editorial board says, actually, unfortunately, faster than we even thought. And why? Because speculation abounds. This is unbelievable, and this is to that viewer's point that I just read. Democrats are freaking out because a stand on principle could cost him Michigan. The White House staff apparently hasn't thought about how many states he risks losing if he kneecaps one of America's allies, closest allies, I would add, in the early stages of its war for survival. Survival. And I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm surprised isn't the right word. If you saw those graphic videos and what was done on October 7th, and you read the, the reporting and you saw the videos, I don't know how you couldn't say Israel's got to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth. It is, it was barbaric. I, I can't even use the words that I want to use. And it's like, uh, again, I keep saying this, but former Congressman Joe Sempolinsky, who was on the program yesterday, said if Israel was playing by Hamas's rules, they would have wiped them out with a nuke. They would. This would have been all over if they played by the same rules. But Israel doesn't. But the media has always done a great job, and I use the term great, um, not in a positive way, a great job of painting, well, victim shaming, to use their word, victim shaming, of painting Israel as too aggressive. And I do not recommend anybody goes goes and looks at those videos and those pictures of what happened on October seventh. I it's too disturbing. But they also do speak volumes of what Israel is dealing with. And I, I got on a tangent, but I but it's important to know if if they follow the same rules, it'd be a much different game. They're not. They are being strategic, and it may not be. You know, one civilian is too many. We're, we're, it's all heartbreaking for us. But the nature of, even to Senator Murphy, who, who may not wanted to admit it, well, I, I, I want to say that. He did say it pretty clear, saying that they hide their civilians, they uh, they're hide their weapons in heavily civilized areas. Let me, let me give you the exact quote. There's no doubt that Hamas is responsible for these civilian casualties. Because they hide themselves 
their weapons, their infrastructure inside civilian buildings, mosques, schools, and hospitals. And again, then he goes on to say, but Israel has, you know, got to take the moral high ground. If we don't, if they don't wipe Hamas off the, the face of the planet, this will be, continue to happen. We had um, a quote yesterday, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going to paraphrase, from a Hamas leader who said, we're going to do October 7th again and again and again. One October 7th after another October 7th, meaning more terrorist attacks, more terrorist attacks. That's why Hamas has to be eradicated. So, wow, I'm, I'm, we're talking a lot and don't have a lot of time. So I'll continue. For starters, enough relief is already getting in because that's one of the arguments. So they just, they need relief. They need it. The only issue is that Hamas won't let it get to where it needs to go because remember, they have no problem using their civilians, Hamas, using the, these people as shields, as for lack of a better term, public relations for their quote unquote cause by um, putting these civilians in uh, in harm's way. And if the terrorists learn that holding on to their hostages, because that's one of the arguments that are being made, okay, th there's a pause, we're not going to attack anymore if you give us the hostages. So if the terrorists learn that holding on to their hostages can get Biden to make the IDF freeze its assault, that's exactly what they'll do. Such games are why they took the hostages in the first place. And this is where the New York Post, I think, hits a nail on the head. And I, I, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I hope they're wrong and that I'm wrong. Biden's only saying pause because he doesn't dare say ceasefire. But you know who did call for a ceasefire just yesterday? Second highest ranking Democrat, Senator Dick Durbin. He's calling for a ceasefire. So you're starting to see the dominoes fall. And there wasn't a lot of apprehension at first for many people that we heard from on the program that, you know, viewers who sent in that the strong stance may not last. And I hope again that we're wrong, but that's what it seems as if we're seeing. He's too recently on record as explaining correctly. This is Biden explaining correctly that any ceasefire is simply a gift to Hamas allowing it a breather amid the IDF's assault. Yeah, that's all it would be is a breather until they can attack again and it all starts over. Here's an idea, says the New York Post editorial board. Here's an idea, Mr. President. Give up on your domestic political goals, meaning worrying about votes, for the duration of this war. If that means dropping your re-election plans, so be it. If you keep playing politics, you're liable to bring disaster overseas and in the 2024 elections and go down in history as the worst president ever. And what, what they're saying there is, and in the 2024 elections, meaning that you might be worried about Michigan, but how many people will you lose because you caved to these demands for from the more extreme part of your party? The, well, I don't know if it is extreme. I don't know, I don't know the numbers. I shouldn't say that. From, but from your party to cave, and call for ceasefire. And the fact that Dick Durbin is doing it should raise alarms. We gotta take a break. I'll, I'll tell you what he had to say when we come back. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC TV. Big Fox moving fast this morning. <music> Calling for a ceasefire. But it has to be contingent on the immediate release of hostages being held by Hamas. So what does that do? Of course, it encourages more hostage taking. It also, it then gives them the pause so that they can cause destruction yet again. It, it's, uh, I don't know if it's naivete. I, I, I really don't know what the answer is, why they always go down this path. I think that it is about politics. I'll continue. Um, Durbin, who just last month, was among 99 senators to sign on to a resolution, quote, standing with Israel against terrorism. Standing with Israel against terrorism. Now, he said, let's face it, this has gone on for decades. Whenever the rationale from the beginning, it, was not, it has now reached an intolerable level. We need to have a resolution in the Middle East that gives some promise for the future. So it's intolerable now. So how long, when you signed that resolution, how long were you thinking of standing with Israel? out of curiosity, against terrorism. When did it, when, when was the time frame? 
what was intolerable was the barbaric nature of October 7th, was the attacks on October 7th. Now, and House Speaker Mike Johnson had this to say when he heard about these calls for ceasefire. Because, you know, you had the AOCs and the people he expected it from. But now this year from Durban. He said it was disturbing. There was a ceasefire, said Johnson, because before October 7th, and Hamas broke it, and Israelis suffered unspeakable acts of evil. Yeah, there was a ceasefire until October 7th when Hamas broke it. And I, lo- I like that line. And Israelis suffered unspeakable, that's what we have to remember, unspeakable acts of evil. He continued, Israel doesn't need a ceasefire. It needs its allies to cease with the politics and deliver support now. And that's what we're doing, meaning the House. I, I think that was a very forceful statement and one that needed to be made. Enough with the politics. One more well, two more quick breaks, but we're, we're going to wrap up one break here. And then when we come back, where do you hear what Salon Magazine had to say about America and a bigger threat to America than Hamas? Who could it be? We'll find out when we come back. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking. We're back with Frankly Speaking. I'm Frank Akam. Let's get right to it. First, a comment that I received during break. Between Cornell West and RFK Jr., the Democrats should already lose at least four of the battleground states. States that were decided by only thousands of votes will decide the next election. Thank you for that comment. Now, the media and RFK's uh, staff are suggesting, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, that he's actually taking votes away from Donald Trump because of his um, past anti-vax stance i don't know i don't see if that's what you're really uh into that topic that you're into i don't understand why you would go to rfk why wouldn't you just i don't see a trump what i'm trying to boil this down to is i don't see a trump supporter saying well i'm gonna go to rfk jr because of this one issue i maybe i'm wrong weigh in please salon magazine just just give you an idea of the kind of rhetoric and division we have in this country. Salon Magazine, I'm, I'm guessing not a lot of subscribers in this audience, but they said they published an essay, an essay declaring MAGA Republicans, meaning I, I guess Trump supporters, MAGA Republicans and Christian supporters a, quote, bigger threat to America than the Hamas terrorist Perpetrators. Now, we talked about the real concerns with the open porous border and how we hope not, but the FBI is saying it's the biggest threat of terrorism in our country in a very long time. So we're concerned. But you shouldn't be, according to Brian Karam, the author of this piece, the title, I'm not going to go into any more because we're going to take our last break, but MAGA and Christian nationalism, bigger threat to America than Hamas could ever be now is he doing that i'll ask you the question is he doing or putting that out in that way to try to get the shock value to get the comments going back and forth to get whatever kind of social media shares because if not that that is well again i think it may be a look into how divided um the country is and how how much some people deem a Trump supporter or whatever, the enemy, Christians or Trump supporters. I don't know if MAGA can, I mean, I assume that means Trump supporters, but that the they would consider them the enemy. Um, the New York Post says, will universities clean house of anti-Semitic professors? Don't bet on it. Uh, when we come back, we're going to wrap things up. I know we haven't talked about it yet. Hunter Biden, the new opinion contributor at USA Today. We're going to talk about that when we come back. Last break. And we're going to wrap things up. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Aikum, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. So Hunter Biden did an opinion piece at USA Today. And the headline is, I fought to get sober. Political weaponization of my addiction hurts me more or hurts more than me. So what he is suggesting, if I can boil it down because we're nearly out of time, is Uh, He suggests Fox News Republicans 
are attacking him and it's going to cause people who need help from their addiction to not get that help. After what I've gone through since my brother Bo died in 2015 and the perpetual public humiliation of me, I'm now certain I can survive anything except a drink or a drug. The effort of recovery is something that should be celebrated. And I hope that despite my role as a punchline and punching bag for some, others will also make the effort I have made. Joe Gabriel Simonson said, the message of Hunter Biden's op-ed today is that because Republicans are so mean to him, other addicts might not seek treatment. That's what it all boils down to. Fox News contributor Joe Concha said the first son was using his addiction as a crutch. The criticism has zero to do with his addiction and everything to do with influence peddling. And that's what um, this piece continues with. Stop playing the victim, Hunter Biden. It's about corruption, not addiction. Because he tries to go after the New York Post. He tries to go after Fox. And he, and he also says, hey, don't blame me on these questionable, perhaps, influence peddling. Don't blame me on that. It was all the drugs. But the scandal is, in all of this, the influence peddling. And we can go through the history of that. You know all about it. It's been talked about uh, in at least conservative outlets for a long time. You know what the vast majority of the stories that have reported on it, and it's not normally in the mainstream media, we know that. The, the, the majority of the stories that what they don't mention, Hunter's drug addiction. But that's what he's saying in the op-ed. Because we're not weaponizing, says the New York Post, addiction. We're reporting on the intersection of Hunter's business dealings and Joe Biden's political career. Bless everyone who has put in the hard work to tackle drug addiction. We would never demonize anyone who has struggled with it, responds the Post. But the first tenet of recovery is admitting you have a problem. Hunter Biden has never acknowledged that he did what he did was wrong. In fact, he shamefully hides behind substance abuse as an excuse for his actions. You're not the victim, Hunter. All right. Do we have anything we can wrap up on? Oh, hey, here's something interesting I probably shouldn't have saved right till the end. Out of Oregon. You always got to keep in mind when there's far left places um, that when they come up with a new bill or new law, we should probably pay attention here in New York because it's probably uh, will be on our doorstep in no time. Oregon just dropped all graduation standards. for their students in the name of equity. In public education's latest blunder, the Oregon Department of Education has just decided that basic reading, writing, and math skills are not required for students to graduate with a high school diploma. We are out of time for today's edition of Frankly Speaking. Thank you to everybody uh, commenting, everybody who was reaching out. I also want to thank candidate for Corning City Council in the fourth ward, Lisa Illigoman for being our guest and giving us so much time throughout this political season. Let's put up on the screen, I'm proud of next week's lineup. That's next week's lineup, so mark your calendar. Allison Hunt will join us on Monday. She's candidate for Steuben County Legislature. On Tuesday, Vicki Olin will give us all the information we need to know, so we're prepared to go in the booth that day. And by the way, the polls will be open when we go on the air. So Vicki Olin will be our guest on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we're going to talk election results. We're going to have that conversation. We're going to get you all the information. I know we've had candidates on, like this morning, on the fourth ward, both candidates. Um, that's going to be a, a race to watch in Corning. We also have the legislative race. Elson Hunt's going to join us. That's one, a close one to watch. There's plenty to talk about on Wednesday. Thursday, Don McLean. He wrote American Pie. We're going to talk about his career. And on Friday, Kevin from Twin Tiers Comic Con. So a very busy week next week. I hope you'll join us. Every weekday morning, starting at 7 for Frankly Speaking, only on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm Frank Agam. Have a great day, everyone, and we will talk to you on a Monday morning. I look forward to it already.